I uh, heard a song a few weeks ago, and when I uh, heard the song, I knew it was uh, a Jason Russell song. And he proved it in the first service, and he'll prove it again in just a moment. I never read or speak uh, before someone sings, but uh, this is uh, a unique scripture that I want you to kind of have in mind when he's singing it. Uh, it's Genesis 22, and here's, let me just read the scripture to you. Now, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham... And he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we, key word there, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father? He said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on, your, on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Literally, Jehovah Jireh, the God will provide. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Son, blessed Isaac was his name, the greatest gift he'd ever known. Then came the day who would have dreamed God would say, You gotta give him back to me, and on this man. And you must prove it's you and Isaac or it's me and you when I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart but my father's proud and on this altar where he lays justified but it wasn't him God wanted me Now most of us I dare to say Oh we've got an 
Isaac standing in God's way. But on this altar we will prove it's not your Isaac that God wants, but he wants you. When I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart, but my father's proud. And on this altar where he lays, justified it wasn't him, God wanted me. When I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart, but my father's proud. And on this altar where he lays, Justified, but it wasn't him. God wanted me. And on this altar where he lays, justified, but it wasn't him. God wanted me. That's a Jason Russell song right there, isn't it? Did it great. What a wonderful picture. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and look in Genesis 22. We're going to get there. One of the things that um, has been a kind of unusual for me, I'm, throughout all my ministry, I have preached a minimum of four times a week, every week. And there would be a, I, I would probably, there was 20 years I wasn't out of the pulpit but one time because of sickness in 20 years. I never took vacations where I would miss Sunday. I was always going to be uh, in God's house. and I, I enjoyed that. That's kind of who I am. That's kind of what God made me to be. I don't have to worry about those things. And I, I, so There were probably 10 years straight that I spoke it five times a week, every week. People say, well, you know, how did you come up with all that? My problem has never been... Not having enough to say. My problem has always been having too much to say. Y'all can say amen to that. But during this time that we've been kind of going through, uh, and I haven't been able to preach, but maybe like once a week, it's been a little difficult. And I've, been, I've got this series and, and that series. Matter of fact, I, if God didn't give me any new material, I'd be good till like November. I really would. But there was a, a, a series that God just continued to bless me with, out of Genesis, and y'all know I love Genesis. It's a great book. But I call it Faith and Blessing. Faith and Blessing. You know, faith, we're going to talk about Abraham. And he's called the father of faith. And in the New Testament, sometimes we put two different words together. We say faith and works. Martin Luther, back in the uh, 16th century, said that uh, he really enjoyed the book of Galatians, The Just Shall Live by Faith. It was his favorite book. Um, but James, the half-brother of Jesus, when he wrote the book of James, he said, faith without works is dead. Now, in the New Testament, we've come to understand that we're to have an understanding of God and a belief in God and a trust in God where we can not only believe but follow God no matter the circumstance, we call that faith. We don't have to see it. He can be the God of tomorrow, but he's the God of tomorrow for our today. He's a right now kind of God. And we can hear from God. We can believe God. We can trust God. We can hold on to the promises of God by faith. But I really believe that what James was saying is that you should have corresponding actions in your life. I don't think that's any different from faith. As a matter of fact, I think they're the same thing. I think, as you can say, you say that you have faith, I have works. I will show you my faith by my works. But I also don't want to have works that don't have faith applied to it. That's the labor of man, and that always is a dead end. So in our life, we need to grasp faith and blessings. 
because that's God's way. Now, hold on. That means God will give blessings the way he wants to give blessings. God will give blessings the way it will give him honor and glory, and it is what is best for you. He doesn't say he'll give us our wants, but he'll take care of our needs. He doesn't say that he'll just do that which makes you feel good, even though oftentimes that's really what we're looking for. God says, I will bless. And I believe that we need to take God at his word. If he promises it, then I can stand on it. If he says, if it, if it pleases God to say, if you'll walk with me, I desire a relationship with you, and I'll be more than happy to pour out myself to you, I think we need to take him up on that. In the book of Genesis, in the first chapter, it begins by saying, in the beginning, God. And I've heard it said many times, and I believe it. If you can believe the first four words of this Bible, you can believe all the rest of it. He is the Alpha, the beginning, but that means he's also the Omega, the end. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first, and we, by, by goodness, he's going to be the last. We're going to stand on Christ and Christ alone. In the beginning, God, but God has no timetable. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When God created, God cannot do anything wrong. God cannot create sin. God cannot create anything that's not perfect. So everything that God does, he does good, right, well, perfect, love, glory, holy. It's all good. So when God created the heavens and the earth, he created it good. He created it good. In his image, for his glory, that means it had, it had the nature of God on it. When you think of God and all that he is, that's what his nature was. Could you imagine the smile that was on God's face when he saw all this and he said, it is good. And when he made man and Eve, Adam and Eve, and he had joy in them. The creator God had a relationship with the creation. And all of creation Bask in the glory of God. Every blade of grass brought glory to God. Perfect. Every, uh, everything that flew through the heavens were, that, were the parade of God's glory. Every fish in all the waters, as different as they could be, swam with the existence of God. Perfect the way God meant it to be. Every animal in perfect, perfect relationship with every other animal all in honor, all in glory. Every fruit of every bush, of every tree, every flower that bloomed, all shouting the perfect symphony of the creation of our holy God, all representing His nature, His love. Could you imagine being there where there's only love? Could you imagine... The Garden of Eden and the joy of the Garden of Eden. How wonderful it was. And God was welcome. And man knew nothing other than the pureness of God. And what a wonderful thing it was. Nothing was withheld. All the good was there. There was one thing they were to stay away from, but that was for their betterment. They lived in the will and the way of God, and it was good. But then there was the fall, where the will and the way of man stepped in and overrided. Oh my goodness. In the Garden of Eden, it was the will and the ways of God. And then sin came in, and it was the will and the way of man. God didn't want it that way. It became a, a day of hardship. Broken heart. 
disappointment, difficulty, a day of shame, when God didn't want us to live in shame, a day of hurt, God didn't want us to live in hurt, God didn't want the curse, that was the consequence of sin. God wanted more for us. But man chose their will. By the way, we do too. When I was thinking about this, and I began this study, I began with the end in mind. I think the culmination is Genesis 22. I think it shows the, the journey that Abraham made, learning God, learning to walk with God, learning to trust God, learning to believe in God through life's difficulties. And that's what we need to do too. I've been thinking about this year. You know, can I, can I just say that I think we need to not get mad about this year and quit bemoaning this year. God, for such a time as this, God's let us be here. My, my granddaughter probably won't remember 2020. She's five. But if God tarries and we talk about it later on, I'll say, you remember 2020? That was some more of a year. Think of all that we've gone through. We began the year, they were mad at the president trying to get him out of office, and the next thing you know, we got COVID, and everybody's scared to death, and then the next thing you know, everybody's mad at everybody, and I mean, just blatant sin and and disregard for everybody else, and it's just a terrible thing that we're living in. Just terrible thing. I mean, murder on video. Who would have ever thought? What a year. And this is what I find. Maybe you'll agree with me. I was, when I was studying this, I thought, you know, we're facing a lot of uncertainty this year. Anybody facing uncertainty in here? You know, the one thing I've said about all that we're going through this and Y'all are doing a very good job in social distancing. I think we're doing as good a job as any church that it's around. We're doing our dead level best to be safe and clean. And, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Matter of fact, I sent out a survey this week because I wanted to hear from you how you thought we were doing and what we could do better. And, and just, I mean, all the response, it was a, amazing. You know, some, most of y'all responded. And, and one of the questions that I, I asked was, uh, what is it God's taught you this year? Have you grown? And almost unanimously, during this time, we all want it to be back to the way it was before. By the way, I want better than that. I don't want to waste this year. Hopefully, I'm going to learn something. Hopefully, I'm going to grow in it. One of the questions was, what has God taught you this year? And almost unanimously, everybody said, I really haven't grown as much as I should have. It's been a hard year. And I haven't done as much in my walk with God. We need to take advantage of that. Is there uncertainty? Absolutely. I think we're out of our comfort zone. And everybody wants to get back, gets back to the comfort zone. But I really wasn't that comfortable before. Life's tough. There is heartache. There is pain. There is loss. There is grief. There is sickness. There is brokenness. There is things that are just not right. As soon as I think that we're going to get past some of these things, it raises its ugly head again, and we face it again. I think we're going to be out of our comfort zone for a long time. And there are life adjustments, listen to me now, that need to be made. But most people want the adjustments to come back to them and adjust to them when I think we need to adjust to God. Is there uncertainty? Yes. Are we out of our comfort zone? Yes. Yes. Should we be making life adjustments? Absolutely. You see, this is what I think we need to learn. God called us to this. We're here. 
We need to take advantage of it. We need to grow. We need to begin to walk the life of faith so that we can have the blessings that God has promised. God's not a liar. I mean, it's okay to say, hey, God, you promised. There's nothing wrong with that. And when I look at Abraham's life, God called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees from, from something that he had never known because God had something he wanted to do with him. And in, a, in this life's journey that Abraham walked, that we'll talk about, in this journey, it was faced with difficulties. He was challenged with his will and his wants. And would he follow his will or would he follow God's will? I said it before in the Garden of Gethsemane for Adam and Eve, it was my will be done, not yours. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, not my will be done, thy will be done. We need to get our wills and our wants out of the way. And we need to begin to walk by faith and get back to thy will be done, not my will. And it doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't matter the hardship and the pain. It doesn't matter the difficulty and the brokenness and, and, and the sickness and the death and the grief and the loss. None of those things matter. It's an opportunity. Are you listening, church? I hope all of you online that are listening, listen to me. It's about, it's about facing the difficulties with a holy God who has a plan. So let's look at this particular thing that was going on in Abraham's life in the 22nd chapter. It says, it came to pass after these things, and we could say all, we could really say all the things that led up to this, that God tested Abraham. A test. How many of y'all remember school? Anybody ever take a test in school? Anybody ever take a test that you weren't prepared for? I mean, a test was to, to show how well you knew the material, right? And you either passed because you knew the material or you, um, 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 let's just say, uh, um, because you maybe didn't know the material. And for me, I mean, if the teacher tells you we're going to have a test on Friday, you need to get prepared. Can I hear an amen? amen? And if you're not prepared on Friday and you have an oh me rather than an amen, that's on you, right? But there would be a time that the teacher, we would come in and the teacher would say, get out a pencil and a piece of paper. Y'all know what that was? And there would be a pop quiz and you weren't expecting it. Now hold on. Whether you were told a test was coming or it was a pop quiz, you better be ready. Can I tell y'all something? Let me get you ready. There's a test coming. Amen? And there will be a few pop quizzes along the way. And we're going to find out how, how many of y'all believe this from cover to cover? Come on now, how many of you believe it from cover to cover? It's God's word for you, a blessing, a promise. It is good. It's not to hurt you. Can I tell you, there will be a test. It's coming. It might be today. It might be this week. And you better be ready because God might say, uh, pull out a pencil and a piece of paper. Let's just see. God tested Abraham. After all these things that Abraham had been through. Let's see how well you know the material, Abraham. He said, Abraham, by the way, he knew him by name. He knew everything he was facing. Everything he had been through, God had been through with him. Every difficult, every failure. Abraham was a liar. Abraham was a control freak like I am. But how many of you know that even though you may say you're a control freak, there are things out of the, in this world that are beyond your control? You better learn to trust God. You better. It's a, it's a test of faith. 
Abraham said, here I am. He said, now take now your son. Hold on now. Your only Isaac. I, I preach out of the New King James. And in my Bible, if the word is not in the Hebrew, if it's added to it to, to help clarify, it'll be in italics. And, and when I read this, it says, your only son Isaac. But the word son there is in italics. Literally, that word's not in the Hebrew. So if you read it in the Hebrew, he says, take now your son, your only Isaac. Pastor, what do you mean? Ishmael won't do. Ishmael was a failed test. Ishmael was where Sarah and Abraham wanted to take a shortcut to God's promise. Second Timothy says those athletes who participate only can receive the crown if you do it lawfully, faithfully, correctly, right. Shortcuts don't work. Y'all hear that? Ishmael wasn't the choice. That was from the handmaiden. Isaac was from Sarah. Now, he was a miracle birth, amen? 100 years old. Some of y'all men, that gives y'all hope, right? Sarah was 90. That makes y'all women cringe, don't it? Amen? I mean, the nursing home, we don't want to have an outbreak of pregnancies at the nursing home, do we? We don't want it to be the delivery room. But yet, yet, when God chooses the test, you don't get a choice. When God says what you've got to lay down, you don't get to choose what you lay down. You lay down what God tells you to lay down. He says, take your, only I, your son, your only Isaac, whom you love. Can you imagine old 100-year-old Abraham with a newborn? Hey, Sarah, can I feed him? Hey, I'll change a diaper. That's revival right there, Amen. Want, come here, son, let's play. Son, let's go out. We'll spend the day together. And the joy. The, parents, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, how wonderful it is that, to have that relationship and, and just to spend time together. And you just look at your child and you just, you just glow with love. Y'all good with that? He said, uh, take your son, your only Isaac, whom you love. And Abraham said, boy, I do love him. I do love him. He said, uh, go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there. Offer. Offer. Make. Willingly give. As a burnt offering. Lord, what? Offer your son. Your only Isaac. Whom you love. Freely give him as a burnt offering. Hey, dads, what's your heart doing? Lord, did I hear you right? Lord, I know you. You wouldn't ask me to do that. God's not the God of subtraction. He's the God of addition, but sometimes you have to subtract before you can add. Sometimes something's got to be taken away so something can be added to. Can I just give you the end from the beginning? Abraham didn't lose anything. Abraham didn't lose anything, but he had to offer everything. And you've got to be good with that. In this world of uncertainty and no comfort zone, in this world of loss and pain and life adjustments, we need to be ready to adjust to God. We need to be ready to worship God. We need to be ready to offer anything and everything. If there's anything closer to God than Jesus, if there's anything closer to your, in your life than Jesus is, then it's got to go. The number one thing in your heart needs to be Christ and Christ alone. 
The sad thing is, is that most of us don't understand that. Most of us want to live life on our terms. And we want to put God on our terms. In our image. In our wants. God doesn't play that. He says, take your son. And we don't know how long it was between verse 2 and verse 3. Don't know how long. Oh, it was one night, but a night can seem like a thousand years. I don't think he slept much that night, do you? But here's the thing that we need to understand. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about when you're struggling with obedience. You're struggling with the choice. Can I trust God? Will I trust God? Does God really want this for me? Then we got to decide. I don't know what the, I don't know if he yelled at God, cried at God. I don't know if he went out and walked and kicked up the dust. I don't know how is that. But the one thing I do know is when sun came up, it says in verse 3, he rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him. Isaac, his son, split the wood and the burnt offering, rose and went to the place in which God had told him. That tells me he had something on his mind, obedience, and you better get after it. Instead of waiting around, how many times has God told us he's put something in our heart and we want to procrastinate that? We want to, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Lord, Lord, I know this is what God wants, but I don't know if I can do that. You know, we just need to get up and get at it. Let's just do it. Sometimes I want to say, quit talking about it. Let's just, let's just do what God's called us to do. Let's quit wondering if it's God's will, and let's just be about God's will. Verse 4 says, then on the third day. I, that's another sermon for another day, but y'all just think on that. You think there's anything special about the third day? On the third day, he sees the place. And he tells the men, he says, hey, y'all stay here. My boy and I are going to go. We're going to go up on the mountain. Don't you know his heart's starting to beat? And he says, see that mountain? We're going to go up there and we're going to worship God. And we will return. <laughs> he's looking past the offering. And he's seeing the blessing. Come on now. He's looking past the test. And he sees the A+. Plus. Before he even walks up that mountain. And that's a difficult mountain to walk up. It's hard and it makes you weary. And you'll be tired and you'll be worn out. And you'll say, God, no. God, no. As he treks up that mountain. And he gets up there and he puts the rocks in place. He lays the wood down. His son even asks him, Dad, here's the wood. Here's the fire. Where's the lamb? God will provide for himself. He gets up there and he binds his son. Come on now. We're getting real now. He binds his son. What's going through Isaac's mind? Dad, have you lost it? Dad, what are you doing? Dad, I thought you loved me. I do love you as my son. Don't, Dad, I wonder, I wonder what he said. He was human. Surely he would have the same emotions you and I would have. When I say you and I, I mean all of us would have. Think about that when he bound him and laid him on the altar. Wow. And God's watching. He saw him when he left. He saw him three days later. He heard the words when he told his servants, y'all stay here, we'll be back. He heard the conversation with Isaac. He saw him when he bound his hands and laid him there. And he saw him when he reached out his hands to grab the knife. You see, what Abraham was doing was Abraham was looking past the test and he was seeing resurrection. Hebrews tells us, 
Hebrews 11, that Abraham was believing God for resurrection and was willing to go through this to find out that God was able to resurrect what he was offering unto him. You see, and the same God is looking at us. The same God knows your circumstances. The same God knows your brokenness and your difficulties and your heartache and your pain. He's just wondering, are you going to lay it down? Does Christ mean more to you? Do you trust him? We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we're in church, we say a, a hearty amen to that. Amen? amen? But do we? There's going to be a test. Abraham believed in the God of the resurrection. In the God of the resurrection. So when he reached out to get that knife, to cast it down and kill his son, God spoke, Abraham, Abraham, this time Isaac's listening. Here I am, my Lord. All, listen to verse number 12. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. And Isaac's hearing this. And he's starting to understand. And Abraham's feeling the comfort of God's words. For now I know. Experience. You'll experience. There's a lot of us say that we know and believe this. But do you? When the test comes, we're going to find out. But God looks down and says, now I know. I know that you fear God. You reverence God. You worship me. You don't, I don't have a rival. I'm a jealous God, but Abraham, I understand that there's nothing in your life that you love more than me. If you'll put me ahead of Isaac, since you have not withheld your son, you're only from me. <laughs> and Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. I want... It had to be there all along. I don't care if Abraham saw it. God didn't say, go take the ram. He said, take your son, your only Isaac, whom you love. But when God said, no, 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 don't hurt him, Abraham said, well, amen, there's another way. God will provide for himself. He did that at Calvary. He did that at Calvary. You see, most of us want resurrection. We just don't want the death. We want the birth. We just don't want the birth pains. Most of us want the miracle. We just don't want to go through the circumstances that make the miracle a necessity. We want to know God. My favorite verse, my life verse, Philippians 3.10. Paul said from jail where he would give his life that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable even unto death that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Do you know the resurrection God? Have you been to your altar yet where you lay it all down? That most important thing to you? Are you willing to say, not my will, thy will be done? You know, Jesus said if you want to be his disciple, you must deny yourself, not your will, his will. Take up your cross daily. Not a one-time, happened a long time ago type thing. God's wanting us to, to die daily and follow him down this path of difficulty, down this path of brokenness, 
down this path of sickness, down this path, path of upheaval? How many of y'all have had your feelings hurt? How many of you know the scars? You have the scars of the wounds of a friend. How many of you know exactly what I mean when I say loss, grief, burden, heartache, disappointment, brokenness, shame, remorse? How many of you said, Lord, if you don't come through, I'm sunk? That doesn't scare God. And it doesn't need to scare you. Because we know the God of the resurrection. We know the God on the other side of the mountain. We know the God on the other side of the tomb. We want the riches of glory without the pain. See, we've got, we want heaven on earth made in our image for our will to be done. But we forget that we want the riches of heaven down here. <laughs> he left, Jesus left the riches of glory for the poverty of earth. Blessed be the name, the holy name, the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Can I just say it a little differently? Every offering should be given. You see, we need to give an offering. And I'm not talking about passing the plate. <laughs> no. By the way, I've talked more about money in the last three months than I've talked about it, and I can't tell you how long. And even then, when I talk about money, it's just how so you can give, just to give you directions. But I do want to talk an awful lot about an offering. Giving your all to the one who deserves the very best. I wonder what in your life you hold higher than Christ. Think about it right now. Are you still waiting for God to come and give you all of glory now? You see, heaven is not just a place to go to. Heaven is the Spirit of God living here. So Bradley, I carry the God of the resurrection with me every day. David, when I face the difficulty, I know the God of the resurrection is there. When I feel the loss and the pain, there's a comfort that comes. It's beyond understanding because, you see, I've learned to walk. That's why Philippians 3.10 is my life verse. I want to know Him. I want to live the power of the resurrection. And, and for that, I'm going to have to have the fellowship of the suffering. My life's going to have to get to the point where I'm even made conformable unto death. And I've got to be good with that. That's faith. Faith comes before the blessing. Faith is trusting God for the blessing when you don't see how it can be possible. We don't know how we know Abraham died at 175 years old. Most people believe that Isaac was 12 when God took him up the mountain. Just think about that. He'd have 63 more years with that boy of joy, of love. How wonderful it was. I wonder how often they talked about it. Hey, Dad, you remember when? Yes, son, I remember. Oh, I'll never forget that day. You remember 2020? Yeah, I remember 2020. Oh my goodness, what a year. Yeah, a lot of uncertainty. Oh, you remember how we got pushed out of our comfort zone? You remember all the life adjustments that we had to make? Oh yeah, had to make a lot of them. But you know what I remember what God did for me in 2020? God showed himself strong. I grew closer to God than I've ever been. 
I don't want to miss the opportunity. I want to take advantage of this. God's calling us for such a time as this. The faith that God wants to portray in, with, and through us. Let's pray. Father God, for those in this room and those that are watching online, speak personally. Let them know that you are God and that you love them. And you love them so much that you'll allow them to go through a test. So Father, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, speak to hearts. If there's anything in any of our lives that we hold closer than you, than you Father, I pray that we will knowingly, willingly, freely offer it unto you, give it to you. For your will to be done, for your glory alone. And Lord, for those that may be in this place today and they do not know you as their personal Savior, Lord. Father, give them the faith, give them the belief. May they confess their brokenness and sin and heartache and pain. And may they repent of that and believe and trust in you, the God that can be the God of the new day, the new start, the new birth, the resurrection from death into life. Lord, if, if you tarry, I'll leave this world through death. But I've got the riches of glory now, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Lord, no matter what I face, I know you are able. And Father, no matter what is said of me, no matter what the world throws at me, no matter how Satan tries to offend, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Lord, I believe that. I'm going to stand on that. I'm going to walk in that. I will shout that. I will praise you for that. And Father, do a work among your people. Wake us up in this day and in this time of difficulty and hardship and pain. And Lord, let us stand for the challenge, the test that you've placed before us. And may we pass it well. Lord, may it begin even now. And Lord, may it begin even in me. I hold you greater and higher. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand with us. Every heart turning to God. Every God looking for Him. Every God bless. Everyone here blessing God. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And we'll see how great. How great is our God. Let's sing that again. How great is our God. How great.